Alors, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, good afternoon. Today, I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Minister Haidu and Minister Blair, and by Dr. Tam and Dr. New. Last night, the Prime Minister held the 25th call with Canada's First Ministers to discuss their shared response to COVID-19. The Prime Minister reiterated to his colleagues our government's commitment to supporting provinces and territories, and also to supporting Canadians during the difficult pandemic. Les premiers ministres ont, ont également discuté de l'importance d'éviter tout voyage non essentiel, tant qu'au pays qu'à l'étranger, et de renforcer les mesures de contrôle aux frontières pour les personnes qui reviennent de voyage. Now is clearly not the time to travel. Stay close to home. We know the pandemic is not easy. It's been extraordinarily difficult. But together, as Canadians, we will come through this. I would now like to ask my colleague, Bill Blair, the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, to say a few words. Bill? Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister LeBlanc. Uh, first of all, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for joining us today. Fighting the ongoing pandemic, remains the Government of Canada's top priority, and we will continue to take strong action to limit the spread of COVID-19 in our country. That includes providing support to the provinces and territories. And from the very beginning, we have been very clear, excuse me, fr from the very beginning, we have been in regular contact with our provincial and territorial partners to assess the needs of the hardest hit regions and to provide support that will help protect the health and safety of Canadians going forward. And today, we are building on that support with an important announcement. As the Prime Minister said a short time ago, the Government of Canada will deploy two federal mobile health units to the Greater Toronto Area. And this is in response to a request that we have received for assistance from the province of Ontario. These units will be staffed by the province and have facility for up to 100 beds in each of them. They will provide additional hospital beds and facilitate the transfer of non-critical care patients out of critical care to ensure that these specialized resources are available for those who will need it the most. And this will help relieve pressure on Ontario's strained hospital capacity due to the prevalence of COVID-19 in the province of Ontario. We will continue to work with our provincial and territorial partners to assess the need for similar units elsewhere in the country. The Government of Canada has also been providing support to the provinces and territories through federal surge capacity support. This, that includes laboratory and testing assistance and equipment and help with contact tracing and funding for voluntary self-isolation sites. In response to requests for federal assistance, we've also provided support to improve the situation in long-term care facilities in both Ontario and Quebec. In Quebec, as you'll recall, members of the Canadian Armed Forces provided assistance last year to 47 long-term care facilities primarily in the hardest hit regions of Montreal, Laval, and monte -Rigier. The Government of Canada also provided funding to support the transition from the Canadian Armed Forces to the Canadian Red Cross. And Red Cross teams continue to provide assistance in long-term care facilities in Quebec and will do so at least until March 31st and as long as they are required. The Ontario government, uh, in Ontario, the, the Government of Canada has deployed 275 members of the Canadian Armed Forces last spring to provide support in seven long-term care homes in that province. And that de deployment ended at the end of June when the province indicated that their situation had stabilized. In response to subsequent requests for federal assistance, we have provided funding to support the Canadian Red Cross operations in 27 long-term care homes across Ontario, and they will remain in place until March 31st or as long as they are required. The Government of Canada has also approved a request from Manitoba last November for federal assistance for long-term care, term care facilities. And in response to that request, we worked with the Red Cross to support its COVID-19 response efforts in LTCs in Manitoba. I, am all, I would also note that members of the Canadian Armed Forces were deployed in December to the Shemattawa and Red Sucker Lake First Nations in Manitoba, and arrived this week in Garden Hill First Nation to help fight the spread of COVID-19 in those communities. We know that the need for relief and assistance continues to be of great need and concern across the country. And we are standing by 
to provide additional support to our partners, including the provinces and territories as required. Let me also take this opportunity, if I may, to reiterate that Canada has implemented some of the strongest border measures in the world. Temporary restrictions remain on optional and discretionary travel right across all of our borders. We will continue to strongly advise Canadians against travel, travel abroad unless it's absolutely necessary and to be very clear, it is not the time to travel now. Those who do travel must now go through the extra step of getting pre-departure tests before they can return back home. And it's important to note that this does not replace the required quarantine period. Quarantine has been and continues to be our most effective measure, and it remains mandatory. We have scaled up the presence of the border services and public health officers at our border to ensure that people understand their quarantine obligations to verify their quarantine plans. And we are working with the provinces and territories to ensure that there is follow-up and enforcement of those quarantine requirements. The vast majority of Canadians have been very responsible in adhering to the quarantine requirements, but unfortunately, some do not follow the rules and there needs to be follow-up, enforcement, and consequences for those who choose to put others at risk. No matter where you're coming from or how you enter Canada, and unless explicitly exempt, you are required to quarantine for 14 days upon your arrival and compliance is essential. If you break the rules of quarantine, the penalties could be severe, up to six months in jail or up to $750,000 in fines. But perhaps more importantly, the consequences of putting your family, your friends, and your community at risk are things that I think all responsibility, responsible Canadians should take very seriously. As, as all COVID-19 decisions, including those related to the border, continue to be made, with the health, safety, and security of Canadians as our most important and overriding priority. And as always, we'll continue to work with all of our partners, the provinces and territories, and use science and evidence to inform all further steps to keep Canadians safe. Thank you very much. And I'll return to, to you, Dominic. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And now uh, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Tam and Dr. New to say a few words, and finally we'll conclude uh, with our colleague, Minister Haidu. So over to you, Dr. Tam. And bonjour à toutes et à tous. There have been over 731,000 cases of COVID-19 in Canada, including 18,622 deaths and over 67,000 active cases across the country. Nationally, an average of 6,080 new cases have been reported daily over the past week. There continue to be high numbers of people experiencing severe illness. There are an average of over 4,650 individuals with COVID-19 being treated in Canadian hospitals, 870 of whom are in critical care, and on average, 149 deaths are being reported each day. Canada continues to monitor for virus variants of concern. To date, the National Microbiology Laboratory reports 31 cases of the B117 variant that was first identified in the United Kingdom, and three cases of the B1351 variant that was first identified in South Africa. From now on, we're going to be referring to the um, scientific nomenclature of these variants. <clears throat> As the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines proceeds across Canada, federal, provincial and territorial authorities are working closely together to monitor vaccine safety. As of January the 15th, there have been 90 reports of adverse events following immunization. These include any health problems that occurs following immunization, but is not necessarily caused by the vaccine. 27 of these reports, that is one in 22,000 doses distributed, were considered serious, such as a severe allergic reaction. All serious events undergo a detailed investigation. To date, no unexpected vaccine safety issues have been identified. Although national daily case counts have been trending down in the past 10 days, daily case counts are still elevated and regional fluctuations in disease and outbreak activity continue. This gives us hope that community-based control measures are starting to take effect, but it is still too soon to be sure that these measures are strong enough and broad enough to set us on a steady downward trend. 
Likewise, as severe outcomes will continue to lag behind increased disease activity, we can expect to see ongoing heavy impacts on our healthcare system and health workforce for weeks to come. Recalling our track down the curve of the first wave, we talked about the need for caution to avoid pitfalls that would stall or reverse our progress. This time, the way down is even more complicated, with much higher daily case counts, more affected areas across the country, the emergence of new virus variants of concern, and stretched and exhausted healthcare capacity. On this even trickier path, we know that the same certainty as the last time, that if we ease up too soon or too quickly, resurgence will be swift and strong. Every day, we are one step closer and better times are ahead, but there is no fast track. We must stick with public health measures and individual practices that we know are effective for controlling spread. Unless and until infections rates are low enough to allow public health authorities to test, trace, and isolate effectively, easing of restrictions risks even stronger resurgence. This is why we must all continue to do our part to slow the spread. And that means postponing vacation travel to a better time in the future, avoiding, shortening, or limiting outings and activities to just the essentials, and maintaining hand washing, masking, and spacing to limit opportunities for the virus to spread. This is the tough part of the COVID-19 marathon, but together it will be easier. Thank you. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Jusqu'à maintenant, il y a eu plus de 731 000 cas de COVID-19 au Canada, dont 18 622 décès. Il y a actuellement plus de 67 000 cas actifs au pays. À l'échelle nationale, 6 080 nouveaux cas ont été signalés en moyenne tous les jours au cours de la dernière semaine. Le nombre de personnes présentant des symptômes graves demeure élevé. En moyenne, plus de 4 650 personnes atteintes de la COVID-19 sont traitées au réseau hôpitalier, dont 860 000 se trouvent dans les unités de soins intensifs et en moyenne, 149 décès sont signalés chaque jour. Le Canada de surveiller l'apparition de variants préoccupants de virus. À ce jour, le Laboratoire national de microbiologie signale 31 cas de variants détectés initialement au Royaume-Uni, le variant B117, et trois cas de variants détectés pour la première fois en Afrique du Sud, le variant B1351. Nous utiliserons dorénavant la nouvelle nomenclature de ces variants. Alors que, alors que le déploiement des vaccins contre la COVID-19 se poursuit dans tout le Canada, les autorités fédérales, provinciales et territoriales travaillent en étroite collaboration pour surveiller l'innocuité des vaccins. En date du 15 janvier, il y a eu 90 déclarations de réactions indésirables suivant l'immunisation, sur ce qui comprend les problèmes de santé qui surviennent après l'immunisation mais qui ne sont pas nécessairement causés par le vaccin. De ce nombre, 27 réactions, ce qui représente environ un quart sur 22 000 doses distribuées, ont été jugées graves, comme une réaction allergique grave. Toutes les réactions graves font l'objet d'une enquête approfondie. Jusqu'à présent, aucun problème imprévu lié à l'innocuité du vaccin n'a été déclaré. Bien que les chiffres quotidiens nationaux soit à la baisse depuis dix jours, le nombre de cas quotidiens demeure élevé et nous observons toujours des fluctuations régionales pour ce qui est de la transmission de la maladie et de l'apparition d'éclosion. Cette situation nous donne à espérer que les mesures de contrôle communautaire commencent à porter leurs fruits. Cependant, il est encore trop tôt pour affirmer avec certitude que ces mesures sont assez efficaces et suffisamment étendues pour nous permettre de maintenir une tendance à la baisse. De même, comme nous continuerons de constater des complications graves après l'augmentation de la transmission de la maladie, nous pouvons nous attendre à observer de façon continue de lourds conséquences sur notre système de santé et sur l'effectif du secteur de la santé au cours des semaines à venir. Gardons l'esprit que nous avons réussi à faire chute la courbe de la première vague nous avons parlé de la nécessité de faire preuve de prudence pour éviter 
de tout faire stagner ou d'aller à l'encontre de nos progrès. Cette fois, il est encore plus compliqué de faire chuter la courbe, étant donné les nombres de cas quotidiens beaucoup plus élevés, le plus grand nombre de régions touchées à l'échelle du pays, l'apparition des variants préoccupants du virus, ainsi que l'épuisement des travailleurs de la santé dont la capacité est mise à rude épreuve. La lutte est, et la lutte est cette fois encore plus difficile et nous savons avec la même certitude que la dernière fois que si nous relâchons nos efforts trop tôt ou trop rapidement, la recrudescence sera rapide et forte. Chaque jour, nous sommes plus près de temps meilleur. Toutefois, il n'y a pas de façon rapide. Nous devons nous en tenir aux mesures de santé publique et aux pratiques individuelles que nous savons efficaces pour contrôler la propagation. Tant que les taux d'infection ne, ne seront pas suffisamment bas pour permettre aux autorités de santé publique de dépister, de rechercher et d'isoler les cas de manière efficace, l'allègement des restrictions risque d'entraîner une recrudescence encore plus forte. C'est pourquoi nous devons tous continuer à contribuer au ralentissement de la propagation. Cela signifie de reporter nos voyages de vacances à un moment plus favorable, d'éviter ou d'écorter nos sorties et nos activités ou de les limiter à l'essentiel et de continuer à nous laver les mains, à porter un masque et à respecter les principes de distanciation pour limiter les possibilités de propagation du virus. Nous en sommes à la partie difficile de la longue lutte contre la pandémie de COVID-19. Ensemble, nous la mènerons plus facilement. Merci. Alors, merci beaucoup. Uh, merci beaucoup, Dr. New. So, uh, Patty, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dominic and, and uh, colleagues. Good afternoon. Every time that you decided to stay home this week, you helped protect our healthcare workers and hospitals. And over this past week, over 50,000 people have canceled their flights and postponed travel. Thank you so much for protecting each other. Less travel means less risk for everyone. Au Québécois et aux Québécoises, merci de respecter le couvre-feu comme vous, vous le faites. Vous aidez à protéger les travailleurs de la santé et les hôpitaux. I encourage you to keep going and to continue to follow public health advice. While our government is working to get you vaccines as soon as possible, you can continue to make a difference. You can continue to save lives. And you make a difference by wearing a mask when you need to go out and by getting tested when you have symptoms. Remember, if you have any symptoms, even if mild, stay home, isolate, contact your local public health unit to ask about testing. And download the COVID app if you still haven't. Please keep sharing credible resources to help your close, your, your close ones have access to the right information on COVID-19 and vaccines. We update Health Canada's website regularly with new information. And just this morning, we added a new chart on the number of vaccines administered across the country. Now, as Canadians, we know that winter is difficult, but good things are happening because Canadians really are helping each other. More people are receiving the, their COVID vaccine. But we, as Dr. Tam and Dr. New have pointed out, we still have to keep pulling together. Now's not the time to let down our guard. Keep reaching out to vulnerable people in your communities and think about the resources that you can use or tell your friends and family about to take care of your mental health, like wellnesstogether.ca. And mark your calendar to join the conversation on mental health next week for Bell's Let's Talk Day on January 28th. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Patty. Alors, ça nous fera plaisir, évidemment, de prendre les questions. Bonjour, merci à tous. Nous allons donc procéder à la période de questions. Nous allons prendre euh, des questions au téléphone aujourd'hui. Euh, chaque journaliste a le droit à une question et une question de suivi. We will now move on to questions on the phone. Each reporter can have one question and a follow-up question. To the ministers and the doctors, a reminder to put yourself on mute uh, when you're not answering a question. Uh, opérateur, première question. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Veuillez, s'il vous plaît, appuyer sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. And our first question, la première question est de Rachel Haynes from CTV. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. 
Hi, ministers and doctors. Um, my first question is for Minister Blair about uh, travel requirements and international travel. Are you considering uh, stricter enforcement measures and quarantine measures when people return uh, from international travel? As uh, Dr. Tam mentioned, there are now 31 cases of the UK variant here in Canada. And today, even out of uh, the UK, Boris Johnson is saying that this variant is more fatal. So does that cause some concern and uh, think, make you think that you need to have increased measures when people arrive? Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for the question. It's an important one. Um, and, and yes, we are concerned with, with the variants, and it's one of the reasons we've taken already some fairly significant steps in requiring all international um, travelers to, to submit to a, a pre-departure test within 72 hours of, of, the, of their departure to Canada. That measure has now been was put in place in direct response uh, to the concerns of, about the variant. But we are also examining um, uh, all measures, and, and I will tell, tell you simply nothing is off the table. We're looking at taking whatever steps are necessary to protect Canadians. And, and you know, we're looking at a range of options to, you know, strongly disincentivize. We've, we have issued a number of significant advisories urging Canadians not to travel for discretionary purposes. But unfortunately, we, we have seen, and I think Canadians are quite understandably concerned, that some people are choosing to go on their spring break trip or, or to continue to travel to other areas that potentially put them and then upon their return, other Canadians at risk. And so we are looking at a number of measures um, that can include uh, further restrictions on international travel, ad additional tracing measures, uh, additional quarantine measures, and enforcement measures in order to disincentivize and discourage people from making unnecessary trips. Um, we'll do what is necessary to protect Canadians. And, and I also want to reiterate, you know, we've been listening very carefully and working very hard with our provincial and territorial partners. We understand their concern, and, and it's a concern we all share. And so we'll work together. Uh, to address these concerns, and and we'll continue to add layers of protection um, in response to to any emerging threat um, that 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 we may face in re in regards to this, and we'll continue to reinforce the already very strong measures that we have put in place. Um, uh, the last thing I would mention is we have seen a, a significant um, indication from our American uh, allies and partners um, that they are undertaking a number of measures, and I also want to to to. Um, indicate that that we are in in discussions with them and will continue to work with them uh, to create s symmetry in in the way in which we respond. A, a, a loophole, frankly, does exist because the Americans um, previously had not placed any restriction on 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 international flights coming into the U.S. and and so that that concerns us um, because that that. Uh, Restriction is in our, at our land borders, but not in air travel. And so we'll be working with the Americans on, on developing new reciprocal measures that can further protect Canadians as well. Do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Um, and just as a follow-up to that, I mean, you're talking about measures that are going to be coming into place soon. But in the meantime, there have been over 100 uh, flights that have come into Canada with um, passengers that have had confirmed cases of COVID-19. Just in the last week, uh, Health Canada, Canada has posted on their website that there are three flights that have come in from Haiti where all rows have been exposed to uh, COVID-19. So in the meantime, um, how how soon can people expect to have these uh, new measures in place? And, you know, how concerning is that to Canadians when they see that there are still these a large number of flights that are coming in and posing a risk. Again, thank you, Rachel, for, for the, for the follow-up question. And, and, and let me reiterate that over two weeks ago, we imposed measures that required that all incoming uh, passengers uh, from any international destination, including from Haiti, be, be subject to a, 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 a pre-test, a negative test within 72 hours of departure. There were some challenges in certain countries, including Haiti, with obtaining those tests uh, in, in that jurisdiction. And so a number of measures were put in place. All of the, the people that came from those destinations, in, including Haiti, where the tests were not available, were immediately, upon their arrival, uh, referred into secretary, uh, secondary and referred to the public health officials. They were not allowed to move into the Canadian uh, community and, and until steps had been taken to ensure that they did not pose a risk. And that's, that's why we were, we were able to detect um, through, through how we dealt with, with those individuals who were arriving um, very responsibly, uh, in, in my opinion, 
to identify those who, who could be infected that had not yet previously had the test. We have now implemented new, new measures because a testing regime has been established that will allow us to test those people prior to departure. But we did, we did take action to protect Canadians and Canadians' health against those arrivals that had not yet been able to take the test. But I also want to reiterate, you know, we are continuing to look at all available measures. We will do what is necessary to protect Canadians. I, I would re remind you that, that we have among the strongest uh, protections at our borders of any country in the world, but we're continuing uh, to examine all of the ways in which, which we can further strengthen um, that protection because we, we, we remain, share the Canadians' concern about the introduction of these variants. I think we've taken very, very strong action. We'll continue to look at ways in which we can improve our response. Merci. Thank you. Prochaine question. Next question. The next question, la prochaine question est de Lina Dib de la Presse canadienne. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. Ma question est pour vous, Monsieur Leblanc. Vous étiez à, à, sur l'appel hier avec les premiers ministres des provinces et vous avez sûrement entendu Monsieur Legault réclamer d'autres mesures pour décourager les voyages. Alors, j'aimerais savoir qu'est-ce qui qu'est-ce qui vous retarde, qu'est-ce qui vous retient. Est-ce que je peux comprendre de ce que Monsieur Blair vient de dire à ma collègue de CTV en réponse à sa première question que vous attendez de négocier quelque chose d'autre avec les Américains? Est-ce qu'on parle de mesures, surtout pour les vols américains, qui vont être changés? Euh, merci pour la question. Juste une précision. Hier soir, je n'ai pas pu assister à, à la conférence téléphonique avec les premiers ministres. Je parlais oh, aux journalistes. C'est ça, je parlais aux journalistes à, au sujet d'un autre, autre item. Euh, cependant, j'ai été briefé, évidemment, sur la conférence, euh, sur la rencontre. Et de fait, les premiers ministres ont discuté la question des frontières internationales. M. Legault a répété quest ce qu'il a dit publiquement, c'est qu'il souhaitait avoir des mesures de renforcement, des tests de dépistage, par exemple, à l'arrivée euh, aux aéroports. Et je peux vous dire, comme M. Blair a bien dit il y a quelques moments, nous sommes à, à la recherche des mesures additionnelles, supplémentaires, que nous pourrons mettre en place aux aéroports internationaux. Et euh, on aura probablement des précisions à, à donner dans les prochains jours. Euh, on est, euh, le Conseil des ministres discute activement euh, quelques options. Mais comme M. Blair a aussi dit, euh, la décision ou l'engagement du président Biden d'examiner comment il pourra travailler avec le Canada, avec le Mexique sur la question des frontières, nous donne encore une autre occasion de discuter avec le gouvernement américain des mesures pour renforcer, y compris sur les, les frontières, les points de traversée, les points terrestres où les gens voyagent entre le Canada et les États-Unis. Mais nous sommes, nous sommes à la veille d'ajouter d'autres mesures pour renforcer une position qui est déjà assez sévère aux frontières internationales, mais si on peut faire des choses davantage, ben nous sommes tout à fait ouverts à le faire. D'accord. Et sur ce chiffre de 50 000 que votre collègue, Mme Haïdou, a encore cité, euh, on a de la difficulté à avoir des, des, des précisions. On parle de 50 000 annulations euh, depuis, euh, depuis quand? Euh, est-ce qu'on parle d'annulation de vol seulement vers l'étranger ou est-ce qu'on parle aussi d'annulation de vol interne au, au Canada? Et si vous ne savez pas, peut-être je pourrais répéter ma question pour euh, euh, la ministre Haidou ou le ministre Blair. Ben, ben c'est ben ça, Lina. Moi, je, je crois que c'est 50 000, 000 voyages à l'international, mais euh, si vous le répétez, euh, Patty ou euh, Bill Blair, okay. peut-être des précisions. Euh, yeah, alors, so allez-y, allez Lina. Merci. So, my, my question, Minister Haidou, you just uh, talked about 50,000 uh, um, reservations that were cancelled. So, I was wondering if uh, you could tell us uh, from what date are we talking about? Are we talking when the PCR tests were um, um, imposed or after that? Do you have a date for the 15,000 cancellation? And are those only international flights or are those also um, in, in Canada flights? Well, th thank you for the question, and we can get you more specifics on the dates and when exactly the cancellations happened. But it, it, you know, the the good news is that Canadians have have seen that the government of Canada is asking them to stop uh, international travel, and in fact, in fact, fifty thousand cancellations of bookings over the last 
uh, last week demonstrate that people are understanding that this is a delicate situation that Canada finds itself in at the moment and uh, that uh, people are pulling together and listening to the government of Canada say, please uh, rethink your travel plans. If it's not absolutely essential, uh, consider postponing or canceling. And so we will make sure that our officials get you the details about uh, when those cancellations began. But yes, the introduction of PCR testing, as well as our reminders on a regular basis, about just how critical it is right now that we all pull together and stay home is certainly resonating with Canadians. And I want to thank the Canadians who have uh, cancelled those plans, who have listened to the concerns, not just of the government, but of fellow Canadians who are saying, please, for the sake of our health care system, for the sake of our seniors and long-term care homes and, and other settings where people are really struggling, stay home. Thank you very much on behalf of the Canadians. Merci. Thank you. Prochaine question. The next question, the prochaine question is Ryan Timulty from the National Post. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, um, this question I think is probably for Dr. Tam. I, I'm wondering about what resources are in place to be able to screen for international variants. Um, you know, how quickly you're able to detect them um, and whether you're confident, I guess, in the number that you're talking about today uh, really captures the full picture of those variants in Canada. Yes, um, thank you for the question. So if you, as you've noticed that um, as soon as we alerted to these variants, um, Canada was able to detect uh, both the B117 and the uh, B1351 variant um, very quickly after after we were notified. And so, um, you know, we, we did a number of different um, approaches to look at sequencing. One is that there was already um, a, a investment into genomics um, through the COVID response, which is called a CanCoGen um, initiative, which, um, which meant that we could go very quickly into the database to look for uh, these mutations. And this is about 5% of the, um, of the uh, positive cases that were screened. Um, and different provinces, I think, have different capacities. So we are trying to enhance those. But we have asked provinces to, who can't do their own um, sequencing, of course, to send it to the National Microbiology Lab as well. And um, some of the approaches that we are taking, uh, I guess, is, is several pronged. One is a more um, sort of surveillance approach where we will be looking for, um, um, you know, ongoing sampling of the cases, but also some very targeted approach as well, such as if there was an outbreak that was unusual, if the cases were related to travel if cases occurred after immunization, or if they occurred in immunocompromised individuals or someone who has a reinfection. So uh, under those circumstances, um, we um, try to get those samples, getting more samples from travelers. Alberta, for example, has been uh, conducting a pilot and all of those samples are being uh, looked at as well. So the, the border testing pilot. Um, so I think uh, the bottom line is that I think um, compared to other countries, we have been sampling a re at a relatively a good rate, but we, I think we need to do more. So right now efforts are uh, you know, um, being stepped up um, to do that um, in a, a more significant way. And one of the key aspects is to join up the data related to the sequence with the epidemiology and other clinical information as well. Yeah, and, and just as a follow-up, you talked a little bit about the potential for travel restrictions. Um, I'm wondering why the delay? Why wait on something like this uh, when we're seeing international variants? When, you know, what's, what's the downside risk in your mind to putting in these new restrictions? Yeah, Ryan, I'll, I'll, let me try to answer that. First of all, we're not delaying. And, and I'll, I'll remind you, when the, the first variant in the UK 
emerged. Uh, we were among the first countries in the world to suspend all flights from the UK. Um, we also have taken other action as, as variants emerged in other jurisdictions. We were also among the first countries in the world to make a requirement for pre-departure, pre-arrival testing uh, 72 hours before people even got on the plane. We have been been responding very quickly and, and we've, we've tried to be very upfront with Canadians to discourage them from, from taking non-essential discretionary travel vacations out of the country at this time. It's not the right time. We're also alerting Canadians that if they have left the country and they may find it increasingly challenging to return because of the measures that, that we are putting in place, I think it's important that, that we do, we, we respond in an appropriate measured way um, and, and in order to ensure the safety of Canadians. But, but we are, have not been in any way delaying our response. We continue to add additional layers of protection uh, that have been, pr been proven necessary based again on, the, on the, the best advice that we are receiving from the Pu Public Health Agency of Canada. We'll continue to do so and, and we're working with our provincial and territorial partners to ensure that the measures that we have put in place, the most effective of which, as I've already said, is quarantine, is truly effective. And in order to do that, we're working with the provinces and territories to improve both compliance and enforcement. We'll continue to look at all available measures, and I think a significant opportunity now arises um, with a, 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 a new modified uh, posture in the United States with respect to, to, to their borders that will give us an opportunity, and, and our officials and, and others are already reaching out and beginning important discussions because that is the, the most common area of travel for Canadians, both out of the country and returning to Canada. And, and so it's important that we maintain some symmetry in a reciprocal arrangement with our, our, our closest ally, partner and neighbour. And so we're working on all of those things, but, but, but we are moving forward, I think, very responsibly and prepared to do what is necessary to keep Canadians safe. Merci, thank you. Next question. The next question, la prochaine question est de Elizabeth McSheffrey from Global News Halifax. Please go ahead, parlez à vous. Hi there. My question is for Minister Blair. Minister, I just want to touch on the decision to suspend the sale of decommissioned RCMP vehicles. Uh, it's been more than nine months since the Nova Scotia shooting, uh, in which the gunman made use of a very convincing replica RCMP cruiser. Why did it take the federal government until now to take this step? Yeah, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, first of all, let me be, be really clear. Impersonating a police officer is and, and remains a very serious criminal offense. And, and we've seen a number of incidents where individuals have attempted to use not just vehicles, but other police equipment, uniforms, et cetera, in order to commit that crime. And it is very serious. It, it is also an area of, of examination in the public inquiry that we have, we have established in Nova Scotia to look at the tragedy that took place in April. Um, police services right across the country, not just the RCMP, but, but police services, municipal and, and provincial police services as well, also often dispose of, of their vehicles. Um, this is an, an, an emerging issue that people um, most recently in Antigonish have, have chosen to purchase and, 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 and modify those vehicles to make them appear to be police vehicles. Um, it is a serious concern to us. I have directed the RCMP to suspend uh, the sale of all of their surplus vehicles until this matter can be resolved. And we're working with uh, both the provinces and territories on, on other responses um, to, to you know, pr protect Canadians from, from this, this new emerging trend where individuals are purchasing these vehicles, modifying them to make them look like police vehicles. Now, we heard very clearly the concern that was being raised in, in, in Nova Scotia, and we've taken the appropriate steps to reassure Canadians that, that we have suspended the sale of those vehicles until additional, more effective steps can be taken. It's also a reality that these vehicles that are being used in this way are not only they're not uniquely available to police services, but also available through through other uh, means. And so we want to make sure that we put in effective measures to prevent individuals from buying these vehicles, either as surplus from police services or from any other source and modifying them to be used in this illegal and inappropriate way. And, and just by way of follow-up, I, I recognize the, the government will work toward more stringent measures. 
Um, but it is still easy to buy LED lights, sirens, push bars, decals, uh, all kinds of, you know, police identifiers. It's still easy to buy those things online and to buy decommissioned vehicles from private sellers online. Uh, so I wonder, you know, how confident you are that this move goes far enough to keep Canadians safe in the interim before you're able to develop those more stringent measures that, that you've spoken about. Uh, we've already taken a number of steps to, to to prevent people from acquiring the deckling that's often used on on our federal police vehicles. But as as I've already indicated, there are police services across the country that I that that vulnerability does exist. You know the 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 availability of some of this equipment. Most provinces, I, I will tell you, have regulations that prevent individuals from equipping any vehicle with red lights, for example, flashing red lights, which are restricted under their laws, their Highway Traffic Act laws. Uh, only for emergency vehicles. So some of those regulations are in place, and it's already, as I've said, a serious criminal offense to, to do that for the purposes of impersonating a police officer. And and so that we have a number of legislative and regulatory tools available to us, but we are working with the provinces and territories to see if we can strengthen that regime um, in order to deal with these individuals who have, you know, we now have two very serious incidents where individuals have modified the, the vehicles for the, for that purpose, and, and we'll take the steps necessary to ensure it doesn't happen. And in the interim, I have directed the RCMP to cease the sale of all of their surplus vehicles, but the vulnerability still remains for uh, for vehicles from other sources, and so there's still work to do, and we're doing that work. Thank you. Uh, opérateur, question. Next question. Thank you. The next question. La question is from Boris Prou, du Devoir. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Uh, oui, bonjour. Ma question s'adresse à M. Uh, Leblanc. Concernant les voyages uh, non essentiels, le gouvernement du Québec a uh, menacé, en quelque sorte, de, de recourir à un plan B, c'est-à-dire de mettre en place lui-même une quarantaine obligatoire à l'hôtel, comme ce que fait la Nouvelle-Zélande. J'aimerais savoir si le fédéral considère que c'est une bonne idée et si euh, ben, il y a des discussions pour implémenter cette idée à la euh, grandeur du pays. Mais, euh, nous sommes en discussion continuelle avec euh, des experts en santé publique, euh, des forces de l'ordre, le ministère de la Sécurité publique, mais aussi nos partenaires dans les provinces pour voir comment nous pouvons renforcer les mesures euh, pour les, les arrivants des, des voyages, euh, par exemple, des vols euh, de l'international. Euh, on a pris connaissance des commentaires de M. Legault. J'ai parlé moi-même, j'ai eu une discussion constructive avec la ministre Sonia Le Lebel du gouvernement euh, du Québec. Et comme j'ai dit, le, le Conseil des ministres est saisi actuellement avec une série d'options pour renforcer et les mesures de quarantaine et les les mesures de dépistage potentiel aux arrivées euh, et nous aurons des précisions au cours des prochains jours, mais euh, nous voulons euh, absolument travailler avec le gouvernement du Québec, mais nous reconnaissons que le gouvernement fédéral peut à tout moment, comme le premier ministre Trudeau a dit à plusieurs reprises, euh, à augmenter des mesures de protection et c'est exactement qu ce que nous allons faire au cours des prochains jours et on aura des précisions euh, littéralement au cours des des prochains jours, et c'est une série d'options qu'on peut euh, utiliser ensemble pour renforcer la posture euh, aux frontières internationales. D'accord, mais en suivi, j'aimerais quand même avoir plus de précisions. Est-ce que c'est envisageable qu'une seule province mette en place ce genre de mesures-là et qu'ailleurs au pays, on continue avec la méthode traditionnelle, celle qui est en place actuellement? Ben, évidemment, c'est mieux si on a les mêmes mesures par exemple, aux quatre aéroports qui ont été désignés pour recevoir des, des vols de l'international. Il y a des vols qui arrivent à Montréal, à Toronto, à Calgary, à Vancouver. Le gouvernement de l'Ontario, j'ai parlé avec le premier ministre Ford euh, à quelques reprises la, cette semaine et en fin de semaine, euh, lui privilégie la, la, la question de faire des tests de dépistage pour tout le monde à l'arrivée aux aéroports. On a pris connaissance des des commentaires de, de M. Legault. Alors, nous sommes tout à fait d'accord à prendre des mesures pour renforcer euh, euh, les frontières euh, internationales, mais nous allons euh, prendre ces décisions basées sur les meilleurs avis des experts, des scientifiques euh, et des euh, responsables de, de la sécurité publique. 
Merci. Thank you. Prochaine question. Next question. The next question, la prochaine question est de Mia Rapson from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Tam. Uh, there have been a couple of new treatments for COVID-19 that have either been um, approved or, or even uh, promoted by Health Canada recently. One of them, uh, a blood thinner treatment. Uh, I believe that uh, I'm just curious if Health Canada has any guidance on, on the use of blood thinners, um, as well as uh, a, another, another drug that was approved and started shipping out uh, in December. I'm just wondering if you can talk about these new treatments and how you think they can help the pandemic and how they should be used. Yes, um, I, I think it's really great that there's more and more evidence on treatments. Um, Health Canada, of course, is a regulatory authority uh, that approves treatments. But uh, um, we are, um, I think, um, really relying on our clinical experts who are on the ground treating patients. So the clinicians who are treating patients uh, have to decide what's best for them. So I think. Um, you know, um, and they will sort of look at the individuals uh, in question to, um, you know, figure out what, what is really um, in their best uh, interest. I think um, what the ones that I'm familiar with that have been used to lies very widely to this point um, are things like dex dexamethasone that is used uh, for hospitalized patients, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory. I do know that you know some of the uh, effects of COVID-19 uh, involves um, you know an impact on uh, your blood vessels or uh, you know inflammation, um, and so I think it would depend on the uh, clinical guidance at this point. Okay, thanks. And for Minister Blair, you've talked a lot about, you said you're not de delaying these decisions about the border, um, and you're talking about the testing that is required and the flight ban, but um, with all due respect, we know people got around the flight ban simply by flying through the United States uh, from the United Kingdom and, and came in, and we've been told for months that testing is just a moment in time, so having a test three days before you get on a plane doesn't mean that 10 minutes after you got the test, you didn't uh, suddenly contract COVID-19. Uh, so I'm just curious... And we also know now that these variants are not just circulating from travelers, but they're circulating in the community. So I'm curious how you expect Canadians to believe that we're really protecting us against these variants when the measures that are being put in place clearly have not worked. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And first of all, let me let me reassure you and, and Canadians that for those individuals, when we put the flight restrictions in prohibiting flights from the United Kingdom in response to the variants that, that emerged there, we also took steps to ensure that those uh, people who chose to fly from the United Kingdom into the United States and then transit through the U.S. to Canada were also identified through, through, through screening by our border service agents. They were referred into Secretary and they were referred to PHAC for further follow-up and, 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 and quarantine measures um, because we recognize that loophole. And I've already spoken about the efforts and the discussion that's taking place with our American colleagues to, to address that potential vulnerability that exists because they're, the measures that they've put in place do not align clearly with our own. I, I think what I want to make perhaps most clear is, is that we are quite open to adding additional layers of protection and, and imposing additional measures. Um, nothing is off, off the table, as I've said, and we are considering um, a, a very wide range of additional options that, that can be imposed. But I think it's equally important that we fully utilize the value of the, the most important tools that we've already put in place. And, and, and I'll go back to what I believe is, is perhaps the best protection is the quarantine um, order that the that, that Public Agency of Canada issues for all arriving travelers. And, and compliance with that order is critical to keeping Canadians safe. The police of jurisdiction, and, and, I, and I listened very carefully to Premier Legault uh, yesterday when he spoke about how, how effective the police of jurisdiction in Quebec, the Sûreté and the municipal police services like the SBVM, were in enforcing the lockdown orders that the province imposed. And, and I would um, also indicate, highlight that it, it, we, we need more enforcement from the police of jurisdiction in, in, in areas where that's the RCMP, the RCMP have that responsibility, but in the vast majority of places, certainly in Ontario, Quebec, the, the police of jurisdiction are in fact the municipal or police, provincial police services in place. They have the tools available to them 
to enforce the compliance with the quarantine orders. And, and I think that that enforcement is also going to be important. And so it's part of an ongoing discussion that we're having with our provincial and territorial partners to ensure that the tools that we have available to us that we know are effective to keep communities safe need to be fully utilized because Canadians have to understand there are real consequences, not just to their health and to their families and their communities, if they break the terms and conditions and requirements of quarantine, but there can also be legal consequences as well. And I know the police have been somewhat reluctant to, to use the enforcement tools that are here, but it's necessary. And so we're having discussions with the RCMP, but also with other police jurisdictions through their provincial and territorial um, um, authorities to ensure that, that the tools that we have are fully utilized. And as I've indicated, we are also working with our international partners, with the provinces and territories to add additional tools and, and, and uh, requirements that we can put in place to provide that health assurance. You know, we, we, we've, we've got a light at the end of the tunnel. The, the emergence of a vaccine and, and, and the exceptional work that, that is taking place to, to, uh, to administer that right across the country is, is, it offers us, I think, a reason for real hope. But we have to ensure that we take the measures now to get through this, this period. And, and, you know, we have all been trying to encourage Canadians to be responsible, to, to, to stop traveling for discretionary purposes, you know, to, to take the steps necessary to, to, for those who are returning Canadians and they have a right of return, but we want to make sure that they do so safely. And so we will continue to put in, you know, layers of protection and control to ensure that, that, that the new variants are not brought into this country and that we deal with them responsibly. And, and as I've also indicated, we know that the illness, as, you've, as was said earlier, is already present in our communities. And so we have to make sure, working with our provinces and territories, that we, we take the steps necessary to protect Canadians, to ensure that our hospital capacity is not exceeded, that we do the work necessary to protect people in long-term care facilities or other vulnerable populations. We're working with our provincial and territorial partners to do all of those things and we'll continue to work hard. We need Canadians to remain vigilant and careful as well. And that's what we're urging people to do. Merci, thank you. We will take a final question. Nous allons prendre une dernière question. Opérateur. The next question, la prochaine question est de Daniel Blanchette-Pelletier de Radio-Canada. Allez-y, la parole est à vous. Bonjour, ma question est pour Dr Tam. J'aimerais savoir quelle est la cible de couverture vaccinale que le Canada a identifiée pour atteindre une certaine immunité collective. Est-ce qu'on parle de 70% ou plus 85% de la population? Les avis divergent là sur le sujet. Bonjour, euh, je vais commencer, mais peut-être euh, Dr. New euh, va ajouter quelque chose aussi. Mais euh, le, le cible n'est pas vraiment euh, connu maintenant. Euh, les experts euh, euh, constatent euh, que peut-être c'est entre 60 et 75 mais ça dépend de... de euh, de connaissances euh, à l'avenir aussi, parce que euh, ne sait euh, 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 pas encore euh, connaît l'efficacité le, le, de vaccin pour réduire la, la transmission de virus. Ça, c'est la première euh, question. Euh, donc, euh, pour euh, L'autre euh, considération est que s'il si y a de, de, de nouveaux souches de, de, de virus qui est plus, euh, beaucoup plus transmissible, euh, on a besoin peut-être de plus haut niveau de euh, vaccination pour euh, protéger la communauté. Euh, peut-être que euh, Tenu va ajouter quelque chose ici. Bon. Merci, Dr. Tam. Pas beaucoup de choses à ajouter. Je pense qu'on peut dire que la, la situation est toujours fluide avec l'épidémiologie, comme Dr. Tam a constaté. On ne sait pas exactement c'est quoi peut-être l'impact des, des variants la plus occupant du virus ici, parce que ça, ça, ça continue, le virus continue à avoir des mutations avec la pression quand on a commencé déjà avec la, la vaccination de, de, de la population. Ça, c'est un facteur euh, euh, aussi, euh, on ne sait pas avec, euh, avec euh, les, les, les programmes qui, comptent, qui commencent maintenant à vacciner les Canadiens, mais euh, l'efficacité du vaccin dans un essai clinique, 
n'est pas la même chose que la euh, l'efficacité euh, de vaccination dans le, le, dans le monde réel avec, avec euh, les, les populations. Euh, donc, euh, on continue à, à analyser les données probantes euh, pour euh, l'efficacité euh, de vaccination euh, actuelle ici au Canada, mais aussi à travers le monde. Euh, il y a aussi des, des expériences des autres pays qui, euh, je pense que c'est très important de aussi de, de ramasser, peut-être échanger des données probantes pour, pour voir qu'est-ce qui, euh, qu -ce qui euh, peut nous euh, c'est euh, informé pour, euh, euh, c'est quoi, la couverture euh, vaccinale euh, euh, optimale pour avoir la communauté d'immunité à, à, à l'échelle de la population. Merci. Et, et en sous-question, bon, je comprends qu'il peut y avoir un, un seuil minimal qui pourrait aussi être beaucoup plus élevé selon tous ces facteurs-là. Est-ce que vous pensez que, peu importe quelle va être la cible que le Canada va finalement identifier, on peut réellement l'atteindre, et je ne parle pas ici en termes de doses de vaccins disponibles, mais plutôt en termes de, de volonté de la population à se faire vacciner. C'est Dr. New, peut-être moi je peux commencer. Oui, euh, je pense que c'est un, 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 un enjeu important. C'est vraiment pour, euh, comment dire, renforcer et euh, augmenter la confiance des Canadiens dans les vaccins. Je pense que euh, la, la plupart des Canadiens sont euh, très, euh, comment dire, euh, optimiste et aussi euh, euh, encouragé par, par euh, qu ce qu'on a commencé avec euh, la vaccination. Donc, je pense que c'est important de, de continuer d'être transparent avec nos communications. On a déjà constaté aujourd'hui, euh, même les, les, les effets peut-être secondaires, euh, peut-être qui, euh, qui euh, sont, euh, qui suivent une vaccination, mais pas, pas, pas nécessairement liés à la vaccination. C'est important aussi de, de, de faire une enquête aussi pour euh, pour communiquer avec les Canadiens pour être euh, vraiment comme dit, transparent. Et euh, jusqu'à date, il n'y a pas, vraiment pas, pas des, 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 euh, des, des, des événements préoccupants, mais on continue de travailler étroitement avec euh, les, les provinces et les territoires euh, pour euh, ramasser les données probantes. Je pense euh, au, euh, au futur, que, je pense qu'avec l'expérience, avec euh, le plus de Canadiens qui, se, euh, qui seront vaccinés, je pense que ça va encourager les autres Canadiens. À être vacciné. Je pense que vraiment le but euh, reste toujours le, le, le même, c'est d'offrir au moins la vaccination à tous les Canadiens euh, pour qui les, les vaccins sont recommandés. Hein. Et c'est vraiment le but de, de, de peut-être avoir le, le, le plus grand nombre de Canadiens vaccinés d'ici la fin du mois de septembre. Merci à tous. Thank you everyone. This puts an end to today's press conference. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse d'aujourd'hui. Merci.